Welcome to the Entrepreneur Experiment podcast with me, Gary Fox. Today, I'm talking to Mark Legg, the co-founder of And Open. This podcast is brought to you by Sage. Sage is the number one provider of payroll, HR, and finance software to small and medium-sized enterprises all across the globe, just like me and you. To learn more about Sage, click the link in the description below. Mark Legg is someone I am connected to in a very bizarre way, which becomes apparent in the podcast. Mark is the co-founder of And Open. And Open are one of the hottest Irish startups in the last number of years. They've raised over $30 million. They're a global gifting platform with clients such as Airbnb, Spotify, and Peloton. They are going to be one of the biggest Irish success stories. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say they're going to be one of the biggest Irish success stories in the next five to 10 years. And I am incredibly pleased to sit down and talk to Mark. We talk about how the business pivoted from an e-commerce business and a chance delivery of a letter to Mark's Airbnb changed their entire course of the company and their lives. Here's my chat with Mark Legg, the co-founder of And Open. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Hi Gary, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Delighted to welcome you to our brand new studio. You're only the second ever guest in our beautiful, yeah, we're in the Victorians building by Iconic Offices, so it's our brand new studio, so it's exciting. And you are our 201st episode. Nice. Yeah, that's great. So welcome. I've been, I've been a follower for a while, so I love your pack. Brilliant. You, we, we connected in a very unusual way, which we'll get to later in the episode. Yeah. You started off in a, quite a niche business. You know, it was quite an unusual business that you started, but you ended up co- doing something completely different. How does that journey happen? Yeah, um, it's been quite a journey. Um, I had, so originally, the, the the business was Makers and Brothers. So <coughs> Makers and Brothers was an e-commerce business that... Myself and my brother Jonathan uh, set up, what was it, like 2011? Um, so at the time, Jonathan was very creative. All our, our, all our family are quite creative. Um, so he worked in, in the UK in a, in a design consultancy business. And <coughs> I was working for a private equity company in Ireland, but I was based in Berlin. Um, but we always wanted to do something together. We wanted to work together. And we had... An idea was around <coughs> representing Irish crafts, kind of that kind of area, because we knew that it was a super, <coughs> it was a super um, talented network of of creatives there, but they weren't very well represented globally, um, because a lot of them didn't really engage online. Like they had this super skill, be it like they were a ceramicist or or wood turner or whatever it might have been, <coughs> but they didn't have that knowledge of the online world to to sell their wares online so <clears throat> so we decided to set up this company which would i suppose represent them globally um and we did that alongside physical pop-ups so we would have done pop-ups shops in in new york and london and, and paris <clears throat> and we did that for i suppose we did that for like four years four or five years um that's a very global mindset though to, to start off yeah well like it was super niche like it was so, it was such a, like we knew the Irish market was so small. Okay. So we had to go global from the start. Okay. So you already knew that. Was that inherent in you? You just knew that from, from like you, you obviously travel a lot and yeah. you know, your brother travels a lot. So was that something you just picked up by watching or seeing? Well, like to bring it back even further, we did a, we did a, a pop-up shop here in Dublin on St. William Street. Like that was the incubator for it. Okay. Um, so like that was a physical store. We did it for a month in December um, and we sold out and it was great. Was this before you started Makers yeah, and Brothers? So yeah. this was like the experiment, to, exactly, to coin the phrase. Exactly, this was yeah. the experiment. You're like, let's just see. Yes. And I quickly realized I didn't want to be a... Uh, like a, a shopkeeper like I didn't want to work in a in a, in, a, in an actual shop um but it worked in terms of like there was a market there for it um so I think we just took those learnings I I traveled for a while after that forgot about it Jonathan went back to work and um it wasn't for like a year or two later that we we came back to it and was like let's actually do this and like we were still double jobbing like we still had had our own jobs and we did it on the side and it was very much a family business um like our our warehouse was our parents spare bedroom and (coughs) like um my sister-in-law Kira kind of joined after a couple of years as well and and um so yeah super family business super small really niche 
But I suppose after a few years, we started to see more and more corporates approach us and ask for help, um, be it like launching a new gift or a new product or, uh, or, or they wanted to uh, help with corporate gifting. So that kind of just led us into kind of exploring that space a little bit more and just complete luck at the time I was Airbnb a property for my parents um, and Airbnb had reached out to me to say that this uh, this chap Pedro who had <coughs> was staying close by and he'd been broken into and he'd had a bad experience and could I take him in to, to my parents place uh, which is just close by so <coughs> I did that and um, he stayed with us for like two weeks. Airbnb reached out to me and said, listen, I'd love to send Pedro a gift to say sorry. I was like, fine. I didn't really think much more of it. And then about kind of maybe he'd left and we checked the post box and there was this letter there, which was had a voucher for, I think it was like Smith's Toys for 75 euros. So you could tell they cared deeply about their community, but it just hadn't landed. Like they didn't know... Uh, if he'd got it, they didn't know if he'd liked it. It was for a toy shop, so it was like hard to bring all that back to Spain. And yeah, we just kind of were curious about it, I suppose. And we, we uh, I think my brother had a contact in Airbnb, so he had set up a coffee with one of them and um, kind of got more information that they did a lot of this. And they knew it wasn't working. They knew they couldn't scale it. And, um, <clears throat> and I think we were quite persistent. We did a little bit of gifting with them, like quite high end, because that's kind of where our proposition was at the time. Um, and then it just, again, happened that they were going into this RFP process to find like one global vendor to, to do all of it for their customer service team. Um, and So from pulling a small thread, yeah. just to put the context in that, so from pulling a small thread <laughs> of a little envelope popping through a letterbox, the entrepreneurial mind in you and your brother just pull the thread a little going, okay, why? Okay, yeah. and then why? Okay, and then why? And you trace that all the way back yeah. to Airbnb and then to a global contract. Yeah, yeah. Well, like I'll but That is a <coughs> mad journey, just to put the context on that. That is incredible from a little moment of a postman just like popping that through, it lands on the, on the carpet. How, when they said a global vendor, yeah. uh, at that stage, what size were you? Um, we would have been like five, four or five people, okay. like tiny, like tiny turnover, tiny team, uh, bootstrapped. Um, and like I said, like parents, half the parents' house was, was their stock room. Um, so yeah, we, and that's why they said originally they're like, no, no like the, the RFP had, huge multinational companies like Staples, like billion dollar companies going for this RFP. And um, and that's why they said originally, they were like, no. And we just kept asking and we were like, please, please, can we, can we What join? gave you the belief? And what gave you the confidence to go, yeah, you know what, we, we can do this? I think at the time we very much knew, like the gifting element of it was pretty straightforward for us because we like that's what we did like we knew how to source and design like beautiful gifts and the founders of <coughs> of airbnb are all design background so that was ingrained in, the, in their culture that they really cared <coughs> cared about their community cared about their guests and their hosts and and wanted to embed that in their values and that's why they s they, they spent so such a huge amount of, of time and money on this kind of campaign and that like that the process wasn't easy like it went on for like nine months like we flew to san francisco pitched them in san francisco um and i think like looking back on it now we cared more than the other companies uh, and we couldn't necessarily always do what they were asking for like we didn't have a global network of fulfillment we didn't have anyone technical in the team, so we, we we didn't have those elements, but we brought them in <coughs> over time, and we also maybe kind of fudged it a little bit to be kind of cr like blunt. <laughs> but there's a beautiful thing here, I think we all need to learn, especially as Irish founders, 
to think globally because yeah. it's, it's it's almost a cliche. Oh, you know, act local, think global, but it's very very difficult to do. It's very very difficult to see the big vision, the global vision. Yeah, yeah, and I think like the the fact <coughs> that we have our first customer was such uh, like such a huge company and such a global company meant that we there was n- like that was always what we were uh, we had our sights on like there was like you can't really go back from that like it, w- it was such a huge opportunity it was such a big contract um and i i, I think it just meant that Yes, like it took six months to build out that technology and to build out the infrastructure and the gifts. And we realized that um, that Makers and Brothers, it wasn't a clear fit. So we, we, we kind of ended up kind of parking Makers and Brothers and, and creating a new company called And Open. Was that and, hard? Um, no, well, like we, we were still deeply attached to Makers and Brothers. Like it was yeah. sad to see that go. And yeah, because like, there is an emotional attachment yeah, there, especially yeah, yeah, to yeah. your first company or two. Yeah. You know, it's it's deeply personal. Yeah, and like we had a bit of a, a kind of cult following. Like again, super niche, but like there was quite a following of it. Um, and again, I suppose for everyone, like for context, you're like. What and open is now like it, it it's a global gifting platform. So we help co- companies uh, increase loyalty and retention and engagement through what we like thoughtful acts of care. So otherwise known as, as beautiful gifts. Um, and we do like that's done kind of there's kind of three elements to that. So you have the gifts, you have the technology, and you have the logistics. Uh, and like I was saying, the gifts is the easy piece. Not easy, but like <coughs> somewhat natural to us in terms of like we could really, we were experts in curating really beautiful gifts and we could source those. And uh, and then we brought in the the, the tech piece, which, which is this like platform that enables companies to do it at scale and to automate it. Uh, and then the kind of final piece is just the logistics because <coughs> you need to get those gifts from obviously from the warehouse to the people's, the recipient's hands. So that's like building out that global infrastructure to, to deliver them all. You make it sound very simple. So simple. You make so it sound, I mean, I'm just watching, I'm like, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I get that. And But when you think about it, you know, you and your brother and three or four more people with you from Dublin building this global gifting platform, one of the biggest companies in the world. And at the time, Airbnb was a rocket ship. It still is, but it was a rocket ship. Where did you even start? Like, so that all sounds beautifully logical. Yeah. I completely get it in hindsight now, looking back. I can see the blueprint. I can see, oh, yeah, you do this and this and this. But where did you even start? You, obviously, you built out the, the proposal for them. But where do you even start to design something like that? Yeah, like, we brought in a lot of expertise. Like I was saying, like, the gifts was natural. Like, we all have design backgrounds. And <clears throat> we, like, obviously, we had to find, because ve- we were so niche with Makers and Brothers. Like, we had like our network in Ireland, it was very Irish yes. centered, but we, we now had to, and I'm not saying like uh, we ended up going down with more a mass reduce, like we had to find vendors that could operate more at more, a higher scale. Yeah. Um, so the provenance of the gifts is still there and the narrative and the story of like where they come from, what they're made of, all of that still existed. Um, but it was a job in terms of like actually going about and, and sourcing all of that. And then, obviously, no uh, tech or, or development background, engineering background, w- with either myself, Jonathan, or Kira. So we had to bring in that expertise. Um, and that was through a, a chap I was in school with, uh, Ross, who's now our CTO. So we brought him on during the RFP. And, um, and he's just um, has a great mind for... for, for um, kind of building out what that platform would look like um, and making it because a lot of enterprise grade kind of software is not that intuitive and it's not like what we were looking to build is always more of a consumer facing product because it, it, like our company is is it, it's not like it's a b2b to b to c like it, we are working with the consumer at the end of the day, but it's just true other companies. So it had to be like a consumer facing product. It had to be super user friendly. It had to be 
like fun, playful, engaging, like had to be all of that. So I think that's what kind of Ross and our kind of product team brought to the table and he helped us build out that platform that just does it at scale, which is great. And I think there's something beautiful to that as well in that if you can make something beautiful, why not? Yeah. Why not add yeah. that extra bit of beauty yeah. to it so that, you know, if someone has to use it, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter whether it's B2B. You can see that design ethos yeah. within your business. Yeah. And I, I've, I've seen your platform and I've used it. It's just, and it's the greatest pl- compliment you can give to something. It just works. Yeah. It yeah. just works beautifully. Yeah. You don't have to be like, oh, where do I go now? And what, I have to yeah. copy this in here and then I have to auto. It just works beautifully. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah no, it is because it, like, there's a, a lot yeah. of competitors in, our, in this space. Uh, because, because the more we lent into it, we could see like corporate gifting, that, uh, that space was so broken. Like when you think of corporate gifting, it's, it's a bottle of wine or it's a hamper at Christmas. Like it, it just, it, it's so... Generic. So thoughtless, yeah. generic, soulless. Like it just wasn't working. And if you, then if you're a company that tried to do that internally, which a lot of companies we talk to do, it's so difficult to like make sure the custom and duties are paid to make sure that the gift arrives to the right person's address. Like all of that sounds straightforward, but it's hard to do it at scale. Um, so I think we've always looked to try and maintain that human element to gifting because uh, and that's true the technology enables that because it makes it more engaging it makes it more like the brand is always maintained like it's not like a generic email to you to say uh, like hi gary here's a gift like it's the brand maintains the messaging and that's aligned with their mission and their values and uh, it can be fun and it can like this choice it's not always a physical gift it can be like a digital gift or it can be like you can donate to charity or uh, like we just recently launched one which is like offsetting that that whatever the kind of value of that gift is to like a carbon carbon offsetting project so like there's lots of different gift types and I think what cost what really resonates with customers is that um that element of choice because so many people get the like the typical company merch like the overly branded water bottle like that's exactly what I was thinking of as you said I was like the pens the water bottles and it's just junk you get them in the little drawstring bag and you're like oh god it's it's bright green neon I'm never going to use this so now now it's my problem yeah now I've got to deal with this junk in the house and like I think people are culling they're looking for less yeah you said something very interesting there that technology makes more personal I think it's kind of a trend towards depersonalization and people are blaming technology yeah how did did you think of that because that's tricky because sometimes it is very impersonal yeah. technology everything's automated and you know you get a bot response and oh yeah. our auto bot will come back to you yeah you know it's it's yeah. very cold so how did you do that well i think our all not all like a lot of our first customers were digital companies mm. like they were like the airbnb the spotify the peloton like etsy like they're all digital first companies <clears throat> so that's why they wanted like they wanted to build that human connection to their clients or to their employees and they did that connection through a physical gift like it didn't always have to be a physical gift but a, like a large percentage of that connection is built through a physical gift because it's like it's so hard for companies now to to build loyalty because it's um like even like booking a, a taxi you could go from lyft to uber to free now to the bolt like there's like there's no loyalty there it's just whatever is cheapest um so companies can, like can really use our platform to build that loyalty and to <coughs> and also like during the pandemic we found that it's again it's so hard for companies everyone's remote so like how do you connect with your employees like how do you say thanks for a great job or like happy birthday or you got married like whatever like whatever that kind of um touch point might be like how do you do that from a remote setting so uh, we we saw a huge amount of companies engaging with our platform throughout the pandemic because they wanted to 
be able to to touch their uh, like to reach out and, and connect with their employees i hadn't actually thought of that part but it makes total sense the fact that everything is now going remote yeah so like not only now will you be b2c you'll also be within the uh, within the companies yeah 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 and i think it is it's something also that we've because we're launching a new product uh, and open on demand. Very cool. Yeah. So what's that going to be? So at the moment, our platform is very much kind of aimed at kind of enterprise grade companies in terms of like you are in like you're signing up to like a, a an annual contract and you're paying like a, a fee to use our platform. Mm-hmm. And then uh, so we wanted to be able to reach into kind of more more small and medium sized companies. Um, so and open on demand is like this incredible gifting marketplace. So uh, yeah. initially it's kind of perishable. So it's like food and flowers and and uh, and, and drinks. Um, but it basically enables companies that are doing more like ad hoc gifting. They're yeah. maybe gifting every couple of weeks or every month, or they want to do it at Christmas. Uh, so they just need like a credit card and they pay as they go. So there's no like monthly signups or annual contracts so yeah we've got some really great vendors it's more of a like a drop ship model so like you're you're placing the, the order with the vendor that then ships the gift um but yeah it's in beta at the moment we have really like in ireland we've got vendors like bean and goose chocolate or craft cocktails or um or crate flowers so like there's yeah. lots of kind of again like our competitors in that kind of gifting marketplace space they'll give you an integration into mark into like say amazon and like that's your marketplace and like you can buy and like you give someone a pack of batteries like you you can gift them anything you know (laughs) it's amazon but it's so thoughtless and it it doesn't like you you don't want that choice of millions of different SKUs. like you just want to be able to see okay and open up curated like the best gifts uh, and they can go in and they can choose from those gifts and it's like there's not millions of SKUs there's only like hundreds or thousands that's a huge one choice because yeah, ironically yeah. choice can be debilitating yeah. choice can be paralyzing because you're like it's like when you go to look book hotel and booking.com yeah there's a thousand choices i literally yeah. did this two weeks ago i was literally looking for a hotel and i went on and it was like 250 choices and i was just like yeah i don't even know where to start you do want, I think, the future of in the internet and the future of high-end products is pr- curation. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think like reducing that element of choice because people can get so frozen with with uh, like this the high level of choice. They just want to know that okay, and open are the go-to for a high-quality gift, uh, and then we will have curated that 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 those gifts for them um and and yeah like they <coughs> they'll be able to do that like globally like we're we're, we're going to be targeting north america and uh, and europe first and and then into into asia and latin america probably towards the, the latter half of next year so it's exciting like and it's really meaning it's it's transitioning the company from more of a product-led um uh, proposition so like at the moment when we sign up a new client it, like it takes our engineering team maybe a day or two to onboard like create that tenancy create that platform for that for that client uh whereas with uh and open on like on demand <coughs> that's like a self-serve that's like they log in they get their their, like their password and their login details that they put on their credit card details and they're good to go like it's like done in minutes literally um so it's, it's really me. interesting you say that today because the last person that sat there in that chair was alan meany mm. and they do big heavy b2b products yeah it's within you know fund management so it's pretty heavy and their exact thing is they're moving to product-led marketing yeah they're moving to that they want myself yourself or ben to go, okay, we need this. We have this problem. We're sitting at home yeah. and with the remote in mind, and that it's going to be a ground up movement whereby we start using it, and then we start yeah. bringing it into our companies, and we're like, oh, we're using this great tool. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. we have to start using this. So it's really interesting yeah. that you're also moving in that direction. Yeah, and like even through our, like the, I was saying, we're doing beta, like a, a beta, at the moment for and open on demand, and 
some of the feedback we're getting is like, a, this is a, like this is amazing. I'd love to use this personally, like just to send mm. like, a gift to, to to my boyfriend or my mom or whatever it might be. So like it'll be interesting to see because nothing's stopping them putting on a like a personal card as well as a company card. So it'll be interesting to see like what like is that something that we'll want to kind of lean into and, and go more like direct to consumer as as a product. So it's it's not on the roadmap at the moment, but it, it, it's something that we're just considering as well. Once it gets in the wild, who knows, right? Yeah. That's kind of like your yeah. story. It just you, you <laughs> just opened up, and next thing these things came. You, you people will know the name and open, I think, because you've been and got a lot of coverage in the last kind of six to twelve months. You have been on a trajectory of absolutely monstrous growth, and mm. you've raised a huge sum of funds as well. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, we bootstrapped for three years, um, so we weren't the typical like tech startup. Interesting. I suppose. Okay, so, like, you bootstrapped and open or makers and brothers? No, well, we bootstrapped <coughs> make, uh, makers and brothers for five years. Okay, and, and then and open was created in in kind of early two thousand and seventeen. And we bootstrapped that for three years. Um, and the, the first two years were literally 100% Airbnb. It was just like they were moving so quickly. They were right. like opening up in so many different geographies. And they're like, can you get into Latin America? Can you get into China? Like, uh, and they wanted new um, like product features. And it was like getting into China isn't straightforward like you, you I'd imagine to, it's you, not you have to like set up a whole new distribution you have to set up a different platform that's firewalled and um yeah so it was like fully focused just building out like that everything that that one customer wanted um and then just as a result of like sending out like they were literally sending out thousands and still are like sending out thousands of gifts uh, that we have like our our, our branding on we just started seeing inbounds from people that got these gifts and said, oh, got this amazing gift from Airbnb, but I see that it was kind of like powered by, by you guys. And that was a really clever move, yeah. having <laughs> your own branding on it. That's a yeah. master stroke. You nearly snuck that one by me there. I know. That's yeah. genius. So that just led to inbounds. That just, like, we didn't have a sales team for, like, three years, I'd say. Wow. Um, so your bootstrap first three years and no sales for the first three years. Yeah. No sales, no outbound. Yeah. Yeah, wow. and then um, 2019, <coughs> like our first company, I, like we we onboarded Toru Car Rental, like basically Airbnb for cars, um, and then we work after that. So I, I I think we just took our time to to kind of work it out, and the the market opportunity wasn't obvious from like from the get go. But like the more we kind of lent into it and the more we explored it, we're like, like literally everyone, uh, like 95% of companies are gifting. Mm -hmm. Like uh, that mightn't be like ingrained in their culture or ingrained in their strategy, but like they're either gifting their clients or in the sales cycle or their customers or their uh, employees, like they're doing it at some level. Um, so then that, that opportunity, like that, like that whole market we could see like there wasn't anyone owning that market mm. so <clears throat> we just um considered like we could like it was a profitable business we could keep going and and maybe take on a couple of clients every year and and become more of a, like a lifestyle business if you want to say it. but um the opportunity was too big and there wasn't anyone uh like killing it in the space so we decided to take on a uh, seed round in 21 uh, last year. Um, so that, and again, we wouldn't be in a, a natural seed because <coughs> like we were three years old, we had a big couple of big clients and we were profitable. So like, it wasn't like we have an idea and we want money to execute on it. Mm. We were kind of a bit more evolved than that. Um, so, so yeah, we took on a seed in kind of May of, of 21 and that just enabled us to, to build out the team and to, um, again, invest in, in engineers to develop the product, 
build like we didn't have we had i think one person in sales we didn't have a marketing team didn't have a, a customer success team so like we just built out all these different functions um and when you say seed round yeah how much are we talking 7.6 so yeah i like kind of knew the all answer all but i wanted to hear you say it because that's a, a phenomenal seed well, round for an irish company yeah no you're you're a different case right you're you're completely different than most Irish companies are raised seed, raise seed, I think, to yeah. be honest. Your profile is just completely different. Every, for every, every reason you just said there, yeah. raising money, as in you were making sales, you had a product, you had customers. Yeah. The yeah. dream, right? So, it's, yeah, it, it's quite different. But, like, we, yeah, like, it definitely was not your typical seed. Like, it's all different terms. Like, I, I think someone called it a super seed. Like, there's all different, <laughs> different words for it. But, um, it, yeah, it wasn't your typical seed, and I think... We also looked a little bit outside of Ireland. Um, like we have really great Irish angels, and like Des Trainer from Intercom has been amazing, and uh, Liam Casey in, in PCH. So we, we 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 got some great kind of they're angels. heavy hitting angels. Yeah, they're big angels. They're nice. Like, yeah. they've been super helpful. Um, but in terms of investment, because we had kind of global clients and a lot of them were like US based, we wanted to kind of um we wanted we wanted to bring on investment from a US VC um was that so to signal to the market or was that because you always had a global aspect anyway so why not it makes total sense to have global VCs yes uh, like i think they definitely maybe have a slightly different view of the market like a, a wide like a bigger view of what the opportunity is mm. um and also like not not to sign to kind of like it, it's, uh, at that time when we were looking to raise it wasn't super hard to get a check okay so um what we wanted more than just a check we wanted so we wanted a vc that could really add value and that could really like make connect us into like provide us with mentors or, or connect us into various different like like from a sales opportunity perspective and just really kind of add value to the company and that's what we found with, with, with first round capital which is a, like a US company that or US VC that's backed Uber and a ton of like unicorns um, and yeah like I, I, I and we brought in a couple others like local local globe uh, from the UK uh, and tribal um, based in Ireland so so yeah, it was it was definitely always a view from the start to to um, to get on board with VCs that had a, quite a, a global uh, vision for what the business could be. Um, so that was our seed, uh, and then we've literally well, yeah, I think we closed our our Series A about three months ago now, which was for uh, twenty six million, and that was led by molten uh molten ventures so so it's been it's been an interesting couple of years and um and again molten just came came in like nicola uh who, who's who kind of was our point of contact in molten she was just always been following us and we've all like it's one thing if you're raising money just to even if someone says no to keep in touch with that person and just to give them up like even like to update them every couple of quarters or every couple of months be like okay like you said we needed to do x we've done that and like or or we're working on it and our th these are some of the our metrics and this is how sales are growing this is what revenue is looking like making sure you just keep them because you, you just you you, ne you never know mm. and <coughs> i think the vc network <coughs> is super uh it, it, you do have to be kind of connected into it to 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 open doors and to 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 have see the opportunity as well that's interesting that even you know i think a lot of people would because we've talked about this a lot on this podcast mm. the slow no you know the the past no all the different variations of getting a no but it's interesting the persistence you talk about there yeah. because i think I literally was texting a friend of mine this morning. She she's meeting someone today about funding, and she just chat about how difficult it is. And it seems like it's such a grueling process. Yeah. I think a lot of people pull away then when they get a no. So yeah. your advice is to actually lean forward and go, okay, cool, but we'll still yeah, keep in touch. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely uh, an art to that, right? Well, like 
yeah we got like about 50 or 60 now it's like you, you like it, it's it's not like everyone was like we got the first person we talked to was like yes and we were like okay what do you need uh, this like, is easy it, like it, it's, a, <laughs> it, it's a process and it takes time and uh and we were super new to it like we'd never raised money before so so we kind of yeah, we, we, we brought on someone who had a bit a bit more expertise in that space who was advising us and um and it is it is just about having as many conversations as, as you can and uh, refining the pitch, refining the language that you use is so important. Okay. Like it, it, it is very much a skill to to kind of close cl- close uh, close around. Um how do you exp- expedite the process how do you make it quicker because i've chatted to so many founders and they all say oh you know it's my full-time job now yeah is raising money yeah and it kind of drains them and i can see them yeah. over years just getting worn down by yeah. it how do you because i talked about alan last week and he said the most interesting thing about being in new york is the fast no yeah, 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 you'll, yeah. you'll sit down me and you will sit down for 15 minutes and at the end you'll go gary not for us yeah but go talk to ben yeah 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 and they'll connect you to ben yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I definitely think that you obviously get, like anything you get you, you get better at it over mm. time, and I think the more you are staying in touch with the people that even said no, like you're too big, you're too small, whatever, whatever it might have been, like staying in touch with them, keeping them updated. Um, so you're not like you're not reinventing the wheel every time. Like yes. you're not, like your your seed, your the first time you raise is obviously going to be the hardest, but then like you're tapped into that community like that you you have the connections and if they're like you know that these 10 like you have your hit list of like these are the 10 vcs i want money from and like how am i going to get in front of them like who knows who and like you can do out a whole kind of diagram a flow chart in terms of like how am i going to get in front of this person because he's the guy i need to talk to for 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 this round so so yeah, like you can't shorten it big, uh, by a huge extent, I don't think, but you can definitely try and make it a little bit more efficient by by kind of keeping in touch with people and making sure that uh, you're are, you're talking to the right person and like yeah yeah I think that's probably the best thing to do. You have such a global um, aspect, just a global way of thinking. It's it's fascinating, and then you've even taken that a step further by relocating yourself. Yeah, um, yeah. So I'm currently living in Lisbon. Um, Hence the healthy glow and the happy, the, the happy demeanor. Glow. Yeah, yeah. Um, very much a pandemic kind of induced change. I think, uh, like a lot of people, they they made different kind of changes to their lifestyle during the pandemic. Um, I wa- it was funny that like I was planning on going to the states in early 2020. Like we'd we'd gotten U.S. visas very early on because. Obviously, a lot of our clients were in the U.S. and there was always conversations around someone going out there and opening up an office and growing out our our, our kind of team over there. Um, so that was kind of on the cards early 2020, and then that pandemic happened and that put a, a change on things. And um, and yeah, I I spent the first four months of lockdown with my mother in the west of Ireland, so <laughs> not quite San Francisco or Lisbon, but um, it was when things opened up a little bit in kind of when was it like September twenty twenty? I went over for a couple of months, really enjoyed it. Uh, Why Lisbon? It was purely on a lifestyle. It wasn't a business change, like it wasn't a, like a a company strategy move. Like we weren't looking to open up an office there or anything. It was just um it was just yeah like like it was great climate great food had a bit of a tech scene like web summit a few other things are obviously happening over there um cost of living like quality of life is is great uh, like uh, i love anything to do with the water so uh very like kind of water-based sports a lot of um opportunity to do those over there so like it ticked a lot of boxes mm. for me um and with the with the fact that everyone was working remote, like it, like you could be in the west of Ireland, or you could be in Mexico or Bali or or wherever. Like you just needed Wi-Fi. So uh, have you always had that mentality though? It's it seems like from chatting to you, you've always had that kind of like not nomadic, but you've always been comfortable. You don't need to be in a certain place to be comfortable. You're able to work and be efficient. 
how how do you do that because i think that's a skill a huge amount of us are still trying to figure that out yeah um i definitely think it's harder if you're like if you're running a like a big team like so for me like what i was doing um like i focused on logistics and operations so that was what that was my kind of albeit i didn't have a <coughs> an actual background in that i just really enjoyed it and i i set up our our logistics network and infrastructure and i would have done that some like like it's not like i needed a, a big team to do that so i was always kind of working in relatively small teams and could have done that kind of somewhat remotely um so i think if you're managing a big team it is a little hard to to do it remote albeit like our like i'm not in logistics anymore our head of logistics is is based in the uk and most of the team is in Ireland. So like, I really don't think it's, it's important like where that person is. So like, it's just talent is, is finding the best talent. Like that's what we've focused on. And that's what the pandemic has enabled us to do. Like finding the best talent that doesn't have to be in Ireland. Um, it could be, could be in the UK, it could be in Portugal, it could be in the US. Um, yeah. I think you guys have picked that up faster than most though, because I think a lot of companies are now going, Oh, what are we going to do? Yeah. We're, we're, you know, they're still pitching around in the darkness of, of are we remote? Are we not? Are we hybrid? Are, do we need to get everyone back in the office? And there's all these conflicting stories. Yeah. So you guys have automatically defaulted to that. Yeah, well, like, uh, what, like we were always relatively flexible in terms of like if people wanted to work at home. Like we didn't have set guidelines or rules around it, but if people wanted to work around home, uh, work at home, uh, like it was, but there was, all, there was certain kind of connotations to that that, like if you're at home, uh, you're like you're spending half the day in like in your pajamas in bed or like you're playing <laughs> PlayStation, watching Netflix. Yeah, yeah there was that cliche. It's rubbish, yeah. like because people probably ended up working harder uh, throughout the pandemic. So, um, but yeah, like it's just like we have like we have a relatively pretty flexible workforce, uh, incredible team, um, and I think we've also seen that with companies that we've been working with throughout the pandemic that they've it's been so hard to retain talent mm. um that like employees <coughs> like they you, you obviously like you need to look after them you need to show that you care about them you need to reward them you need to hold on to them and i think like our our like the and open platform is is such a great tool to enable companies to show that they care about their employees and like they can so easily and quickly just <coughs> reach out and and say thank you like you got us through a pandemic or you've launched a new product or um it's like main like it's at the end of the, like like it's it's all about care it's all about uh building relationships and it's all about like just showing that you, like you, you, they've done so much and like you just want to say thank you and to do that through a platform to send a gift and do that quickly and show show that human side is is what we do best and it, it really does like we've seen it <coughs> with like even through the pandemic it was interesting because airbnb obviously their business like reduced dramatically with people tr not traveling i can definitely attest that it did yeah 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 so obviously that wasn't ideal for us but um like on the kind of flip side of that they bounced back a lot quicker um but the problem they had was that a lot of their hosts weren't that keen on actually coming back onto the platform because like it was still like during the pandemic and they weren't too sure so like they engage in our platform to actually gift the hosts to try and entice them back onto the platform. Okay, interesting. Uh, and they saw uh, like they saw like a thirty eight percent increase in um, in retention of of hosts after being gifted. So like we know it works and we know it can be super powerful. The psychology of gifting is fascinating. Mm. Talk to me a little bit about that because there's 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 a magic to it, but it's also it's an art and a science, I, I think, yeah. just my limited experience. So, like, gifting's been around since the start of time. Like, it's, it's not a new concept. Like, it's as old as sin. But um, I think, like, I won't, like, if you go back to even, like, the 1800s, like, gifting was, you gift, 
you made something like it was always a handmade gift uh, and it wasn't really until I think like I won't bore you with the, the history of gifting but like <laughs> it, it was books originally that was like the first mass produced kind of gift and people didn't really know what to make of it and that's why they introduced like a page at the very start that you could write a, a personal note on uh, uh, I never knew that so to make it a bit more personal yeah so <clears throat> that's where it kind of it evolved from and it then became obviously like today's is obviously a lot of things are mass produced but um but in terms of like the psychology like when you give someone you feel good like you know <clears throat> you've done something like you've thought about that person you you've, you've put like you've tried to work out what they're interested in or you've um like you've written them a handwritten not like it doesn't always have to be a physical gift like you just write someone a note and like uh, people was feel uh, will, will think it's strange me saying this but like we always recommend to our clients like not to really gift around Christmas because like everyone is gifting at Christmas mm. so every like you're reverse in, psychology you're, you're yeah I like it with, yeah but like it becomes so much more powerful if you're gifting outside of key moment like if it's a new year's gift or if it's like Easter or if it's the person's birthday or they've un been unwell and you just want to send them a like a wellness pack um it la like it really resonates so much more with the actual person because at Christmas they're just it's just another gift like there's so many that's gifts. a great hack actually I'm gonna steal that that's a great <laughs> idea because yeah you send me something at Christmas I'm happy but you're also kind of like stacking them up or if you send me something in the middle of February I'm like delighted I'm like yeah. oh wow yeah, yeah, surprise yeah, yeah, and yeah. delight right yeah. Yeah. the unexpectedness yeah. of something arriving at your door yeah yeah but it's it's all about like fundamentally it's about building relationships and it's about like uh showing you care and you can you, you do that through like either giving or receiving um and and that's why like so many companies are are using our platform now to to really show that they care um because if if you're if you're not doing that it'll, it'll, <coughs> it'll like it's it's so hard to like it's such a digital world mm. at the moment and so many people like it's hard to build that loyalty on, on kind of digital platforms so doing that through digital gifts or physical gifts or don't like the donation element it can be can be just really a really really nice thing to do you're a massively global company now and i know sustainability is something you're very very focused on so mm. can you talk to me a bit more about that because i think in the last couple of years companies have become hyper conscious yeah. of how they're operating where they're sourcing, how they're delivering. Yep. So can you talk to me a little bit more about what you guys are doing? So I know you're leading the way on this. Yeah. Um, yeah, like gifting, like the gifting business, like it's inherently mm. wasteful. Um, and like we kind of realize that. Um, so like there's a couple of things that we're trying to do to make it more sustainable. Um, giving person choice, obviously, like the person can decline the gift. They don't have to take the gift. Um, bringing in a really great digital offer. So when you think of digital gifts, you tend to think of your like Starbucks vouchers or Amazon vouchers, and they're, they're a bit thoughtless. So our digital gifts are a little bit more curated, a little bit more thoughtful, It's or experiential, educational. It's like a masterclass uh, subscription or a Headspace voucher or nice, yeah. uh, Airbnb experiences. So it's a, it, there's a bit more uh, depth to it. Um, and then you can also make a donation like to a charity of your choice or a charity of the company's choice and then the one that I mentioned earlier is just uh, the carbon offsetting so we, we partnered with a company called Patch a uh, US uh, tech company that enables you to offset uh, the carbon uh, from, from that gift uh, towards like I think there's like about 14 or 15 different projects so it could be like a kelp farm in Maine, or it could be like a reforestation project in that's Brazil. That's cool. So I like that. <clears throat> so like that's that's one element. Um, like we have a very strict criteria in terms of co like going through finding new suppliers. Like they have to go through a scorecard of I think the twenty four different um, kind of uh, like accreditations in terms of like uh, like who are they working with? Okay. Like yeah. Do they use recycled products? Are they using um are they uh, maintaining like certain policies and structures around their who they employ 
Uh, so the, this is like that's pretty whole, comprehensive. Well, like the, the whole checklist that they have to go through before <laughs> we can say, okay, these guys are are, are good to be on board. Well, I guess clients. they're kind of representing you as well, right? Totally, they're kind yeah, of a representative yeah, yeah. of you. You're kind of putting your trust and your brand on top of theirs. Yeah. So I guess it has yeah. to be done. Yeah, and making sure that they are like working. Like we try to work as local as possible. So like depending on where our clients. Cust end customers are so let's just say we're working with spotify and it's a campaign for their u.s marketing team like we will work with our network of vendors that are locally based in in the u.s um so yeah we we like we work with a lot of minority companies um like female founded or like yeah the, there's, there's a ton of different kind of small companies that you can really like our values uh, would be aligned to their values as well so um yeah and then like outside of that we uh we can like there's an option to offset the carbon from the delivery um internally we have a, a really kind of cool educational tool that our like the team can use and it kind of gives them bite-sized pieces of educational content around sustainability so they're kind of learning at the same time as well and yeah, we're also looking to become a B Corp. Um, what is that? So like a B Corp, if you think of it, like probably the best well-known, it would be Patagonia, something like oh, Patagonia. Oh, okay. So it's, um, it's basically a, an accreditation that uh, gives you a commitment to align with a certain set of, of values. And, and it's not just around the environment, it's around your kind of D, D, D and I kind of policies internally and... Um, making sure that you just hold yourself accountable and it's not just purely like a profit-driven company, like you're caring about other things, like you're caring about the environment, you're caring about your team. Uh, and that is something that, yeah, it, it, it's a process that we're going through. It takes probably about a year to do, but it's one that uh, that we've, we've started. And for like naturally, like we did a lot of this holistically through Makers and Brothers, like we always would have, understood the provenance of where our gifts are coming from but like we didn't measure it we didn't report on it we didn't communicate it to people so what we're doing now at the moment is like met like what is our impact like we're sending out x amount of gifts like the, 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 the like they weigh this much they're made of this like that what that carbon footprint is x amount of tons and so once we know what our impact is then we can put in place like measures around reducing that and then start to communicate that to like all our other stakeholders. Um, you uh, guys don't mess around. <laughs> you really don't. I'm just listening to this going, okay, think I'm in reminding myself going 2016, this started like, this is, this yeah. is huge. And like you, you kind of symbolize that phrase of how you do anything is how you do everything. Because you can just see just from the way you're talking, telling me this, like just it's ingrained right throughout your company. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is, is that coming from you, Jonathan and Kira? It, I, I think it is from what you're telling me yeah. about Makers and Brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it, it's definitely ingrained in, in the culture of the company. Um, Has it been hard to keep that, though, as you've grown explosively? Yeah, um, de definitely, like, growth and the pandemic. Like, the, the obviously, maintaining that culture during a pandemic is, is, is hard, particularly when you're onboarding, like, new employees all the time um who maybe didn't have the full story and like weren't worked because obviously uh, there was a lot of the team from makers and brothers that have, are still there and they know the story they know everything but it's it's like feeding that story and that narrative and that that, that those values into in, into uh, the, like all new hires and new team like it's it is hard it, it how do you do that because someone described this to me beautifully they're like gary it's the one room problem yeah when we had one room everyone knew what was happening yeah. you're over here in phone calls just by osmosis you just knew the yeah. culture was we didn't even have to work on the culture yeah. and he's like it was the strangest thing we had two rooms literally in the same building right beside each other but the second room didn't know what was happening in yeah. the first room yeah and then we had to rebuild everything so how did you do it it's it's hard i think like constant communication like making sure you're doing your all hands and the message is getting true, um, like gifting, like we, we, we gift the team a lot in terms of um, 
Makes I'll, sense. I'll just, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll obviously, <laughs> like, would be silly not to. But um, be it like uh, at Christmas or like I've just contradicted myself saying don't give to kids Christmas. That's internal <laughs> though. Yeah, yeah, the rules don't apply. <laughs> but uh, or throughout the year or a wellness pack or, or or just different rewards throughout. So, um, but but like outside of that, like even like we did. Uh, in-person event like we did our kind of summer party in uh, in June I think it was like end of June and we brought everyone in flew everyone over for it and even that just the care like the care and attention that went into the details like people were just like a, a, they were like this is like better than a wedding they're like just making sh- like the details of yeah. everything that was there from the food, like we brought in an amazing chef who did like this incredible menu and it was in a field, like literally in a field uh, down in Wicklow. So it was like just a tent in a field, nice. all these activities around it. Um, so that's the future, it, right? Well, yeah, but it also, it also helps, like obviously it helps bring the team together and everyone loved it. Um, but it also gives a flavor for what, what the company cares about and what, what, what it actually uh, means you know i love that because that's deeper and i think that's the future of hybrid working in the fact that <clears throat> okay it might be two days in the office and three days here or whatever but those landmark memory moments i think are going to be crucial to creating cultures like i can't think of anything more depressing than virtual friday beers yeah like that is just yeah <sighs> Okay, it's better than nothing, but I think those moments are better. You're better off to have four of them or two of them during the year yeah. as opposed to having something a bit weak every every yeah. week. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I think investing in in those kind of in person events is is key to kind of maintaining that culture. Because, um, like you said, it's it's just it's super difficult to do it online. It, it's re- like a, and s- everyone has got such Zoom fatigue. Oh, it's uh, phenomenal that it's 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 hard. So. I think the more of those that you can do, and like people do want to come back into the office, uh, and it it needs to be, like, like I was saying this to you earlier, like it needs to be more like you're not coming in to work as such in terms of like sitting at your desk and on your computer or on calls. It's like you're you're coming in to collaborate on a mm. uh, with, with your team on a on a new product, or uh, it's a, a meeting, or you're brainstorming or it's a sales meeting or marketing meeting or whatever it might be like it's just more of a collaborative meeting rather than just coming in to sit at your desk and not talk to well, you can to do, do this right connect yeah. properly yeah, yeah to yeah. sit across yeah. from your team yeah. and to sit across we met in a kind of a random way mm. yeah it was quite strange i remember i remember i, d- I did the episode i can describe myself as a bit of a health obsessive mm. And I've got more obsessive as I've got older because I'm like, right, I really need to start like looking after myself because I always assumed I was pretty fit. And I did that episode of the podcast where I talked about going to the yeah. functional doctor and I was going to like, you know, get a clap on the back and go, my God, Gary, you the body of the 20 year olds. Uh, and he told me, he's like, oh, and he put the stethoscope on me and he's like, oh, can you hear that? And he puts it on my own heart. And I'm like. Oh yeah, that doesn't sound exactly like I would have thought. You hear in the movies, the healthy bump bump, yeah. and he just diagnosed this this heart issue, which thankfully didn't turn out to be anything massive. Yeah, but I would never have known that I did that, and I've become more and more obsessed. I get my bloods done twice a year, and they check everything, and I get a full physical twice a year. Mm. Um, and when I put that episode out, you emailed me, and I remember yeah. I said to my, my wife Michelle, I was like. This guy listens to the pod because, like, <laughs> you, sometimes, like, it's, it's even weird. It's better now when you're chatting face to face, but when you're doing it at home, you kind of forget people are listening. Mm. I kind of put out the episodes yeah. and then I go on about my life. Yeah, but you forget people are listening all across the globe. So you want to just tell your story on that a little bit if you want. Yeah, so so I think it's powerful <clears throat> to kind of share stuff like this. Yeah, no, like you, I think I was, I would call myself fit and healthy as well, and I uh, definitely was, was into wellness and looking after myself and I think um yeah like I I think like your health kind of sits on a bit of a kind of tectonic plate to a certain extent like it it's something that doesn't move for decades or or years um but everything sits on top of that like your your life your family your relationships your work uh, your goals your dreams everything sits on top of that so when when it kind of 
when it gets disrupted or when it kind of starts to shake and it, it can be it can be it can have quite a strong impact uh, it can be quite traumatic as well so um for me i kind of randomly like i had a, a like going back it's going back to 2015 and i had an operation on my kidneys i had a, it was a benign tumor uh so that was kind of off the back of kind of a, a well randomly enough i'd like I, i'm quite tall i had back problems so i went to my doctor had a pain in my back and he <coughs> sent me for a scan that picked up this this tumor and uh, and you would have been very young at that stage mm, that's that scary was like, yeah mid, like early 30s um so but that was fine like I, I i got surgery it was removed uh didn't have to take out the whole kidney so it was it was quite like it, it wasn't that bad uh, but as a result of that, I would get like scan, like I would get checkups, and I would get go in uh, every year for like a CT and an MRI scan. And it was, um, it was two years later. It was yeah, 2017 that I went in for uh, the, what these scans, and it, it found that my heart was like a little enlarged. So that the 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 chap at the time was like, listen, it, it's fine, like it takes takes at a different angles and i wouldn't be concerned about it but just go in and get a get a get a ultrasound um so a couple of months later i went in and i was getting that done and the chap was chatting away and uh then he just kind of goes goes silent and uh, leaves the room and i'm just lying there that's horrible like yeah. that that feeling because you're already on edge you're already <laughs> massively on edge i think i was only waiting two weeks for mine yeah but those two weeks like just yeah. the narrative just yeah. plays so he came back and he was like listen i'm really sorry but i don't know what's wrong but something's wrong <laughs> well, that's reassuring <laughs> <laughs> and uh you can't leave uh so like that i remember vividly like it was a, i had been down the west of ireland um and I'd been, I'd been like, like, I like I, I love getting outdoors and just doing manual stuff. Like I'd been, I remember I was like building a stone wall down the west of Ireland for my for my folks. Uh, so obviously quite strenuous on the heart, but I was asymptomatic. Like uh, there was no symptoms, um, but th basically my aortic valve was like was leaking. So like it was pumping blood up into the rest of my body, but it was like falling back into my heart because it wasn't uh it wasn't closing properly so as a result of that like your heart's a muscle it was working harder it had gotten bigger um so they knew that uh, they, they couldn't tell me why but they knew i needed a new aortic valve so that was yeah mid-august and uh, like two weeks later i uh i got open heart surgery and and got a, a new new valve um and like the tricky, like the hard bit for me was you have to, like you had this decision, like you can either get a, a man-made valve or you can get like a tissue valve, which is like a cow or, or a pig. Um, but man-made, you, you're on like uh, blood thinners, like warfarin mm. uh, for the rest of your life. Or with the tissue valve, you it, like no drugs, but you, it doesn't like it lasts maybe 20 years so like you had this like sophie's uh, choice <laughs> yeah. yeah pick your and poison exactly and my doctor like the doctor was the surgeon was was, was good but like, he, he wasn't like this mark you need to do this it was very much on me to like choose yeah uh, but no it was fine like i ended up getting the the the, the tissue valve uh, i didn't want to be on the on the drugs every day mm. and also yeah. who knows where medicine is going to be in, in exactly. 20 years yeah. so so yeah like it, but it's traumatic it's open heart surgery like um and it took a while to recover from it like obviously it's um i was at home for for a couple of months like three or four months probably went back into work a little quick too quick um but yeah yeah i i think a lot of pe like i actually heard of one person who went through something similar at around the same time and like quit his job and went traveling and did all these kind of quite dramatic changes and like it's obviously different for everyone um i think for me i've been pretty intentional with what like how my kind of life has gone to a certain extent but it does put a magnifying glass on time like it, you're definitely a lot more conscious of time you're definitely 
a lot more considered around like how I'm spending time, who I'm spending time with. Um, and that for me, like there wasn't like w any w sudden change, but it was, it was definitely like slow considered, like eating healthier, looking after my body, what I put in my body, like lifestyle changes, like moving to Lisbon, obviously fed into that to a certain extent. Um, and the, the wellness element of it for me w was quite strong because I think I'd always kept myself fit, but like it's like you're you're going onto YouTube, you're getting a, some video of like a twenty minute hit session, what, whatever it might have been. Like a, it's it's quite um, and you didn't I didn't have the consistency there either. Mm -hmm. you're like you're doing it because you're going holidays in two months time, so like you want to look good, and then holidays over, you stop, you're back, and you're young and fit anyway, and you yeah, kind of get away yeah. with it. Yeah, but no, I wasn't young anymore, so. <laughs> so I needed a bit more consistency and I needed that just expertise. Like I, I needed someone to be like, listen, Mark, this is what you need to do. And I still had that kind of lingering back issues as well. So it wasn't like I can just hit the gym and, and okay, pump yeah. a load of weights. Like I needed someone to build it up slowly. So, so yeah, I, 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 I just got a, a trainer and um, he's been great. He just had that holistic view of like, it's not just going to the gym is like how are you sleeping how much water have you drank like how, how like how stressed in work are you like it, it's all these elements that come into your wellness that um that have really proved like extremely useful and uh, and it's also the the consistency of of knowing that it's happening like whatever twice a week but he's giving you kind of stuff like it, it's a 20 30 minutes of your day like it, and uh, if someone could capture how you feel after you exercise and, and bottle it and sell it as a pill like everyone would be taking it every there's day. nothing like it yeah. and i think about this all the time there's nothing like that yeah. feeling but there's equally nothing like that little inner voice before you work out going it's yeah. gonna be hard this one yeah. it's gonna be a toughie yeah. you sure a bit yeah. tired today are you Steve, okay, it's yeah. it's phenomenal that that inner demon battle, and I yeah. think the accountability piece, like our health journeys, are almost mirroring each other. Yeah. Like that accountability piece is just so important. But that piece, like that's the first that's the first step. Like, how can you reduce that first step to make it as easy as possible? Uh, so for me, that first step was like actually going to the gym. Like it's dark, it's winter, it's wet, it's cold. I don't want to go. So removing the fact of having to go to the gym and I like just get a yoga mat, get some dumbbells, get a kettlebell. Mm -hmm. Like you're not paying a gym membership, get a trainer and just do it at home. And like, so you don't have that, like that first step is so removed. Remove that so friction, short remove that little like bit of friction. That excuse. Yeah. You're like you're at, like you're out of bed, you're into your living room, your bedroom, whatever, on your yoga mat and you're, you're working out. So it makes it so much easier so much easier and you build those habits and you start to crave it then yeah. i finally built yeah. the routine now where i crave it and i need to do it for my head as much as my health yeah i do it for my head because i find if i don't do it definitely impacts my mental health yeah. definitely and it's, it's it's trickle down i love that phrase you wrote i wrote it down i liked it so much the magnifying glass in your time mm. like that's so important because we kind of go on autopilot sometimes we kind of go through life and we we talked about this over breakfast yeah you know, it's just a routine i need you need habits and routines, but equally you need to make sure you're looking at them every now and again going, am I doing the right thing? Am I, am I on the right path here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's <coughs> it's so important to be able to, um, just to look after yourself and, and to, like everyone as a founder, they're, they're like, oh, you need to work every hour of the day and you need to like the hustle mentality. And like it, it is, such rubbish really because <coughs> you don't need to work every hour of the day and like I, I like I was a victim of that like I worked too too hard at the start and um but it's it it, it, it it's something that you, you just like your sleep is so important like getting getting out getting getting kind of fresh air getting into nature going for a swim um, like just being with your friends or your family, like it's so important to to um, to to your mental health and uh, like 
Like I, I think, and that was something also that I kind of lent into as well during that time because I it was it was a busy few years with like I had kidney surgery, had heart surgery, um, and obviously just scaling a business and around the dad died around the same time as well. So there was like a lot going a lot going on. So <coughs> so I, I I think just get it like therapy as well is is such a there's such a stigma around it as well in in Ireland that like you're in if you're going to a therapist like you're like in some mental asylum with a, a straight jacket on but even the word it used to be like mental illness yeah at least yeah. it's called mental health now yeah. there's such a stigma I remember yeah. again I did an episode about it and like there was this big oh fair play and then yeah. everyone starts texting me going oh yeah I go to I go yeah, to yeah, yeah, I go yeah, to and yeah, I've yeah, known these people yeah. for years and until I said it it was yeah. like this silence of like yeah there is definitely is a stigma no, it's it, getting it's slightly it's better but still there better. though i think it's better and it's also like men are just awful at it as well um but yeah that helped me hugely in terms of like it is i remember someone describing it to me like it's um like it's like a, a it's like a box of lego like it comes with a set of instructions <coughs> like but you are in like you have to build it yourself and it doesn't necessarily always go as you planned it to be, but like you can you can deconstruct it and you can reconstruct it differently and you can reconstruct it better. But like it, it it's always something that um, is evolving and like you have to like go deep on it and and learn like learn so much about yourself. And it's out of everything that I've done over the last five years, I feel like therapy is probably one of the one of the key elements of it. For thanks sure. for sharing that as well and thanks for sharing the health journey because i think that's kind of why i wanted to talk about it today because i think it's very important that we have role models as entrepreneurs who do both mm. you know you, it's okay you know you're not gonna be fit all the time yeah. you're not gonna be healthy all the time and i think it's very important that you can show you can build a world-class company you can do all these things that like the hustle porn experts talk about all yeah. the time yeah but it doesn't have to be that way yeah. there's a million other ways to do it and I think especially for entrepreneurs, therapy is should nearly be mandatory. Mm. You know, if, you, if you called it performance coaching, yeah, 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 we'd be booked out for the next two years. Yeah. And that's essentially how you can reframe it if, if you need a way to yeah. reframe it before you yeah. go because the box of Lego analogy is beautiful. You're dropping analogies left, right, and center well, here so today. I, I definitely not, not self-constructed. Right? <laughs> well, excuse the pun. But like, it, it's important because I think that, that's why I love doing these podcasts with people because you know, everyone has a different story. Mm. And, and we often hear, you know, you open the Sunday Times and there's a nice profile and they're, yeah. they're shilling their next thing, whatever that is. Oh, I really want to talk to you about our Q3 results. And you're like, what a, what a waste of paper because like the, this person with a huge profile and they're just talking the generic stuff, yeah. you know, and it's all very, 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 very surface level. Yeah. So thanks, thanks for being so open and, and sharing that. I have one final question for you. Mm. It's about the book. Uh, is yes. there a book that uh, you would recommend books, or you've enjoyed um, book, books as many as you want yeah 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 um, this one like I've, my friends always give out to me because I or slag me off because I have an awful memory but um, best books I, like I uh, it's going to be slightly off like it's not a business book but perfect um, even better but I yeah, it's called Eat Like a Fish. It's a, it's a fascinating book about um, this chap called Bren Smith who um, was a commercial fisherman. Like, he, he used to work off the coast of... A, a, if you probably watched Dangerous Catch. Oh, I yeah. I, I find that weirdly... <laughs> I couldn't tell you why I do, but I just find it weirdly compelling. So he did that, hated the fact that they were, like, pillaging the oceans and uh, wanted to find a more sustainable way of living off the ocean. Uh so then went into fish farming again and saw how awful that was. Did oyster farming, Hurricane Katrina, nailed him and, and he lost everything. So he eventually lands on uh, seaweed farming and he ah. gets into seaweed farming off the coast of Maine. Uh, and it's super interesting because he's also really good at marketing. Like, uh, because like in Ireland or in Japan, like there's a lot of uses for seaweed, but in the US at the time, like they didn't like they didn't really use it. So he also had to find ways of like how am I going? Like I I I built my my seaweed farm and like it's the joy about seaweed farms is like it's super easy. It's super 
cheap to do uh, and a sequester is like 20 20 times more uh, carbon than than uh, than uh, trees do so it's like this amazing ecosystem but he couldn't sell the seaweed so then he had to go about marketing it and selling oh, it nice and started off getting into like michelin star restaurants in new york um and then like then brings out his own range of like seaweed beer and seaweed chocolate oh, and, like, i love it i'm definitely reading that one killing it so it's a super interesting book um but eat like a fish brilliant. yeah but outside of that anything like alan de botan like school of life um um michael pollan anything about michael pollan is amazing michael pollan, um, alan de botan and michael pollan and it, like business related is it's kind of a knobby title but i don't know but but Tools of Titans is is very good. It's like a cracker in yeah. terms of like just getting those bite sized bullets of information is is super interesting. So yeah, there are my books plural. <laughs> well, the first one I'm all over that, and, and I love yeah. when it's a new one. I've never got that one recommended. So eat like a fish by Brent Smith. Yeah. Mark, thank you so much. Where can people learn a little bit more about and open and yourself? Yeah, um, so website is is andopen.co.co. Um, and our socials are the same, like andopen.co. Um, I'm on Instagram at Mark Lego with an O. Um, and yeah, LinkedIn, all the other usual kind of usual spots. Um, but yeah, no, listen, it's been, I've wanted to do this for a while. Um, and so thanks for having me. It's been really great to come on. Brilliant. I love that. And thank you again for being so open. Yeah, Mark, thank you. thank you so much. Great. Hope you enjoyed my chat with Mark. To go learn more about Mark, go to andopen.co. To learn more about the entrepreneur experiment, go to mrgarryfox.com. I will see you back here next Monday for a brand new version of the Idea Lab. I'll see you then.